All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here on a uh, beautiful mid-August afternoon in DC. It's uh, the we we don't usually get weather this nice here at this time of year. So uh, so it cooperated with us, and we're very happy. And we're very happy you're all with us uh, in person as well as. Uh, our virtual guests. Uh, I am very honored uh, to be uh, on this stage with, uh, with these three folks here. So on behalf of the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, I would like to welcome you all to our live podcast event, The Internet Past, Present, and Future, a conversation with Internet pioneers, Drs. Vince Cerf and Steve Crocker. My name is Joe Catapano. And I am part of the fourth class of Foundry Fellows. In my day job, I manage stakeholder engagement for the North America region for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, as it so happens. These two gentlemen to my left are both uh, past chairs of that organization. The Foundry is a collaborative organization for Internet law and policy professionals who are passionate about disruptive innovation. The Foundry offers members a platform for professional development, constructive debate, and network building within a cohort of skilled attorneys and policy analysts eager to help shape the development of internet law and policy. So our two distinguished guests here today in many ways do not need an introduction, but I will attempt to do a brief one. <laughs> So Vince Cerf is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist for Google. He contributes to global policy development and the continued spread of the internet. And he is the co-designer of the TCP IP protocols and the architecture of the internet. Steve Crocker is President and CEO of Edgemore Research Institute, a nonprofit developing policy tools and concepts for collection and access to registration data. In the early days of network development, he organized the Network Working Group, which was the forerunner of the modern Internet Engineering Task Force, and initiated the Request for Comment Series, or RFC, of notes through which protocol designs are documented and shared. My co-host today is Rima Musa, also part of the fourth class of Foundry Fellows, and I will turn it over to her to introduce herself and go over some of our guidelines for the event. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, everyone, for being here today. My name is Rima Musa. I am currently a law student at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law uh, down in Los Angeles. So I'm really happy to be here in DC with you all today. Uh, I'm also a fellow, as Joe mentioned, with the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, where I am the producer uh, of the Tech Policy Grind podcast and also the West Coast Regional Chair. So to get through some housekeeping, uh, today is a live event, but it is also being recorded as a podcast. So the podcast will go up in a few hours and will be available wherever you get your podcast feed. But keeping that in mind, uh, we ask that you don't engage in any chatter during during the conversation. Um, and just for your information, we won't be taking any audience questions. We took them ahead of time through a form that was sent out to all registered attendees. So if you submit a question through there, we will definitely try to get to it. Uh, so we'll start with some sort of moderated questions that, uh, that Joe and I came up with. And then we'll get into the submitted audience Q&A. All righty, and I'll pass it back off to Joe to get started. Thank you very much. So, you know, for, for me, part of the, the real interesting kind of story of, of this whole thing called the internet is that, you know, not only did you both work on the project, but you've also known each other for a very long time. I mean, you've been great friends uh, since childhood and Van Nuys High School and the, and the whole nine yards. So before we dive into some of the more kind of, you know, policy topics and things like that, uh, maybe giving the audience a sense of, you know, how did you two become friends and how did that friendship kind of evolve into the work itself? So, um, who wants to go first? Keep going. 
Uh, well, so uh, I met Steve around 1959 at Van Nuys High School, and uh, the first thing we discovered is a joint interest in mathematics, and then Steve noticed we didn't have a math club, and so, of course, that was high on his agenda, so uh, a math club got put together, and uh, we ended up competing in the L.A. area uh, for various and sundry prizes. We also um, discovered an interest in computing, which way back in 1960 was um, sort of early, relatively early days. Uh, Steve got permission to use the computers at UCLA, and I tagged along. There's some stories to go along with that, but I think I'll let Steve elaborate on those and maybe a little bit about uh, how it was that you came to Van Nuys, because you had also had high school in Evanston, Illinois. Well, there's uh, a couple of hooks to uh, follow there. Um, yes, yeah, so in, in my in my case, I was my high school years were a bit turbulent. My parents had split up. My uh, mother had moved out of Los Angeles back to Chicago, where she was from, and in a very unplanned and unscheduled way, I wound up essentially alternating years between Evanston Township High School and Van Nuys High School. Uh, at Evanston, I managed to uh, get introduced to computing over at Northwestern University on an IBM 650, one of the first commercially produced computers that you have to look it up in the history mm -hmm. books. And then I was abruptly uh, back at Van Nuys uh, where I had met Vint earlier, um, and uh, we continued our friendship. But before I continue with the computer part, let me, let me talk about that math club. So when I arrived at the, uh, at the high school for 10th grade and discovered to my horror that there was no math club, how can there not be a math club at a high school? Um, so we checked what the rules were and the answer was, yeah, we could, we could go start a math club. So five of us, all boys of course, uh, decided to start this math club. And we learned one of the, at least I learned, one of the most important lessons that has endured because one of the boys decided that we needed a constitution. We spent the entire year arguing about a constitution. We got no mathematics done. <laughs> and, and, and it was perhaps one of those uh, situations where even though that was a disaster in a sense, it was a super cheap lesson that paid off many, many times in the future. So then skipping forward, um, uh, latter part of high school, as, as Vince said, I got access to some computers at UCLA. And you'll enjoy this part. Um, we, were, we were playing with some silly equations and I uh, wanted to map out the, uh, the, the, these equations. And there was a machine in the engineering department, a, a Bendix G15, which was about the size of a Coke machine. Um, and I didn't have any keys or anything, but I'd been given permission to use it. And in those days, there was very little security. Uh, it was not like today. And, the, and, 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 the, and, the, and nobody was using it on the weekend. So on one Saturday, Vint and I trekked all the way over from Van Nuys over the hill, uh, in the mountains, uh, arrive at UCLA. And, the, and we get to the building, and the building is locked. Oh. And Vint observes that the second floor window is open. And I'm thinking, no, we're not. Next thing I know, he's on my shoulders, climbing through the window. It's one of these crank windows. <coughs> and then he comes by and opens the door. It's one of the standard push bar uh, doors. And uh, we taped the door so that we could come in and out and get lunch at the cafeteria. So we spent the day working on the computer. All of the rooms were open. There wasn't any issue there. And we cleaned up properly afterwards. This was spring 1960. 1961, 61. Yeah. spring 61. Over the next decade, we graduated high school, we went to college, we went off to Stanford, I hung around at UCLA, Vint finished in a reasonable amount of time, I didn't, um, and kept hanging around UCLA. But eventually, um, I, I wound up in grad school, and then I got a job at ARPA, now called DARPA, same agency. 1972, uh, I'm working there. I've got a top secret clearance. Vietnam War is in high gear. I've got 
super long hair and a beard, which I had assumed might cause a problem, but it didn't turn out to cause a problem. And then there was this little incident at the Watergate. And the um, Watergate burglars got discovered. And how did they get discovered? They got discovered because they had taped the door to the uh, institution. And the uh, a guard came along, a plainclothes guard, and discovered, called the cops, and the rest is history. And, they, uh, and this shiver that went down my spine was something. Uh, but, uh, but we survived all of that. Can, can I add to Bob's list? Uh, a small little addition to this story. Uh, many years later, uh, around 1999, uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary uh, had these Millennium Evenings. This was Honor the Past and Imagine the Future. So Eric Lander and I are the featured speakers. Uh, we're supposed to talk about uh, genetics and uh, informatics. I wanted to say DNA meets DNS, but they said that was too geeky. Uh, so uh, Hillary introduces us, and she tells this story about breaking into the second floor window. And you know, this is like 30 years later, and I still don't know to this day where she got that information. But you talk about little shivers running up and down your spine. Well, there was there was a situation where our common thesis advisor Jerry Estrin was uh, retiring, and there, it was being honored by the department. And all of his graduate students, or many of them could, could make it, came. And uh, uh, there was a thing Friday night and then Saturday morning of brunch. And uh, we said, and, and the engineering building, the, 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 the site of the crime, was scheduled to be torn down shortly. So we said, uh, you know, maybe we ought to recreate this. And one of our friends, and by this time, friends are full professors instead of, instead of kids, said, I'll bring cameras. Um, so we, act, we, we congregated outside this building uh, the next morning. The same window is still open. <laughs> Vin is still climbing on my shoulders, uh, not me. And so we have artworks, you know, somewhere that uh, somebody can. I have the video. Yeah, we have the Anyway. Yeah, and so now, right, so now we uh, kind of fast forward now <laughs> uh, since, uh, you know, to, to you know, present day and kind of the, the just the expansion of, of the network and what we're doing with now. And now, Rima, I think, is going to take that with a couple of questions about that. So, some decades pass, uh, and we're in the early sort of 2000s, and the internet is scaling. Um, here we are now in 2022. How has the internet sort of evolved from your lens uh, since its initial inception? And what are some of the, the challenges and opportunities um, with the internet that you sort of foresaw? And how has your lens on that evolved uh, since then? So um, it's a question that comes up, as you might imagine, from time to time. You know, what did, what did we see to do? Did, 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 we, did we know what we were doing and how far did we see? And the answer is very straightforward. Everything's proceeding exactly on schedule. <laughs> a more serious answer is that uh, uh, there is uh, a, a certain surprising amount that we could indeed see because the ARPANET, uh, which was the sort of seedling that, that led to the, the internet uh, and developed by ARPA was in a, an environment where all of the participants were at research projects that ARPA was supporting and in essence were living in the future. And by living in the future, I mean that in 1968, for example, at Doug Engelbart's laboratory and, at SRI in Menlo Park, he had invented the mouse. He had uh, interactive graphics and uh, structured text and was able to give demos, and people were using that kind of system on a daily basis. It would be just a few more years before it was commercially feasible and would be embodied in uh, Macs uh, that you could buy from Apple and so forth. But, but there was no question what the vision was. And the same was true of time-sharing systems, interactive systems, uh, artificial intelligence was a mainstream of the work that was going on, even though it was uh, sort of ignored in the general uh, thing. So we, we had a fairly decent 
picture of the future. Now, there are a lot of things that we didn't see. Um, if somebody had explained Facebook to me, I would have said, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and all the, the social media and disinformation would think, boy, that, that's, why would you do that? I'll just stop there. So, um, several things. Uh, first of all, the way you asked that question reminds me of, uh, please uh, explain the universe in 25 words or less. Uh, give three examples. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I'll, I'll do the best I can. Uh, first of all, uh, the ARPANET project that Steve was so centrally involved in for the host-to-host -host protocols uh, tackled some of the key hard problems. I mean, the actual packet switch network was developed by Bol Veronek and Newman, but the host-to-host -host protocols had to deal with uh, considerable diversity, different brands of computers, different memory sizes, uh, uh, and different character encodings, different operating systems. And so uh, trying to solve the uh, interoperability among such a diverse set of machines was one of the core problems that Steve and the network working group had to tackle. Um, when the Ar ARPANET project, uh, I'm sorry, when the internet project gets started, Bob Kahn comes to Stanford in the spring of 73 and sits down and looks at me and he says, we have a problem. And I look at him and I say, what do you mean we? And he said, well, you know, the ARPANETs worked really well. Uh, electronic mail got invented in 1971, uh, networked electronic mail. Uh, and he had already started thinking about how do we use this technology in command and control. So he had already started working on um, a mobile packet radio system that uh, would eventually be installed in the San Francisco Bay Area and a packet satellite system over the Atlantic to uh, link the east, east coast of the U.S. with the west coast of Europe, emulating the situation where you have mobile vehicles with computers in them uh, in a command and control environment or ships at sea that need long distance communication, ship to ship and ship to shore. So he lays out this multi-network problem and it's the internet problem that needs to be solved. We took everything we learned from the ARPANET project, including all the host to host protocols and essentially um, translated that into a multi-network environment. And what was uh, for me uh, a particular high point of all of this is that uh, I followed Steve to ARPA uh, in 1976. In fact, that's what brought me to this town. So I've been here for 46 years now. Um, and the, in 1977, we had gotten enough work done on the TCP IP protocols uh, to test it. So we did a three network test with a mobile vehicle running around in the San Francisco Bay Area, radio connected. Uh, and uh, passing the traffic all the way to Europe and back again over the packet satellite network and down to, from, uh, from SRI International to USC Information Sciences Institute. So it's only about 400 miles between San Francisco and Los Angeles, but the packets went 100,000 miles because they had gone through two internal geosynchronous satellite hops back and forth, and it worked. And I remember leaping around my office saying, it works, it works, you know, as if it couldn't possibly have worked. And if any of you realize that when software works, it's a miracle. So um, <laughs> this was a big deal for me to be able to show that. So to, to come back to a core part of your question, the basic architecture is still as it was in the sense of multiple networks, each with their own boundary, running their own internal operations with a well-defined interface between those autonomous systems. The network still functions that way. It still uses the basic protocols that were invented way back almost 50 years ago. It's, and that's either you or me, it's you. I turned mine off. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it amazes me when you think about it, that this thing has managed the scale by seven orders of magnitude on most dimensions. The number of hosts, the number of networks, the speeds. We were running 50 kilobits per second in the backbone on the ARPANET, 128 kilobits a second on the satellite net, and between 100 and 400 kilobits a second on the mobile radio network. Today at Google, we run an optical fiber network the minimum speed is 400 gigabits per second per optical channel, and we're shooting for 800. 
So uh, it, it is astonishing that a system of this kind could uh, expand to that degree. So on the purely technical side, um, between the Internet Engineering Task Force and the World Wide Web Consortium, the invention of the, of the World Wide Web, the system has scaled dramatically well. The thing which hasn't scaled very well is our ability to use it uh, in a safe and secure way. In the original formulation that Steve was describing, we were all friends, we knew each other, we were engineers, and, and all we cared about was getting it to work. Fast forward to 2022, there are people who li would like it not to work. There are people who would like to spread misinformation and disinformation. And so one of the biggest lessons that I've taken away over the several decades is that this platform, which has been more or less neutral, is an amplifier of everything, including falsehood and you know hate speech and all the other bad things that you can think of. So now we have sociological problems that we need to deal with, and those are not going to be solved with engineering. Those are going to be solved by having common agreements, possibly some regulation, and certainly cooperation across international boundaries to hold people accountable for what they do on the network, and to provide agency to people and institutions and organizations to protect themselves online. So despite 50 years of history, we still have a lot of work to do. So despite being a worldwide tool, the internet still isn't accessible to everyone, especially those in rural communities, developing countries. So what do you make of the lack of sort of widespread uh, accessibility to the internet and how do you think we can address that? The internet has spent a lot more time on this uh, problem of uh, ubiquity and uh, digital divide and so forth than I have, but a, a couple of comments. Um, it, it's 100% it's predictable that when you have a new technology, not everybody's going to get it all at once, and so there's going to be some period out there. Now the question is, how long should that be, and what do you do for when you're in the middle of that transition in some sense, um, which is uh, arguably where we are. Uh, some of that just time will take care of. Some of it you have to put energy into. Uh, I got a big surprise, um, I guess it was during the Clinton administration. I was talking to a guy in the, the White House um, and having sort of a similar discussion. So that was you know, a few decades ago. And he pointed out that in the US, only 95% of the population had access to a telephone which just you know, took my breath away. And he pointed out that there are pockets, some rural pockets and some urban pockets where the people didn't have access to the telephone. So um, you know, we're in that ugly period where it gets harder and harder and harder to squeeze out and get to the very end of that process. And um, uh, how you gauge it and what you do about it along the way is a uh, continuing challenge. Uh, you can fill in much more useful stuff than I can. Well. Uh, first of all, just for fun, I'm uh, chairman of the Marconi Society, and one of the things that we've been doing for the last couple of years is looking at this whole digital divide, digital inclusion problem. So if you go to marconisociety.org, you'll see some of the things that we've been doing. Among them is helping uh, NTIA uh, spend its $42 billion. Now, they haven't sent any of it to us, uh, unfortunately, but we are trying to help with the mapping problem so that you can figure out where do we need uh, internet where we don't have it, or where do we have it, but it isn't adequate. So right now, the global statistics look like about 60% of the world has access to the internet, and the other 40% doesn't. I'm not so sure about those data, because there are 7 billion mobile phones out there. A significant fraction of them are smartphones that have access to the internet. So I am uh, not so sure about the 60-40 split. Uh, in any case, an awful lot of people are going to be encountering the internet for the first time with a mobile phone. And the awkward thing about that is that mobile phones are mostly uh, uh, internet enabled through apps. And so there are millions of those. And so the impression that a lot of people get of the internet is through an app on a mobile phone, which is a, uh, a very modest slice of things that you can actually do. So I have some concern about that. 
the good news, I think, is that we're seeing an extraordinary increase in alternative ways of getting access to the system. So uh, two things that uh, have surprised me. The first one, of course, is the massive expansion of low Earth orbiting satellites, the Sky, uh, Starlink effort that uh, SpaceX is putting in, plus two others, um, Cooper and OneWeb. And so they're well on their way to making it impossible to avoid access to the internet. It'll cover you know, the entire surface of the planet. Now whether it's affordable, whether the speeds are suitable, and all those things still remain to be seen. Uh, the other thing that has surprised me is an incredible amount of investment in optical fiber networks, undersea fiber linking continents together at super high speeds. Uh, at Google, we've been gotten to the point where we're even building our own cable as opposed to having to join with somebody else to deal with the cost. So uh, that's rapidly evolving to the point where there are islands in the Pacific and in the Atlantic that are getting optical fiber connectivity. I would have lost money on that bet. So we are seeing uh, some serious uh, effort for physical infrastructure. There are also uh, real barriers when it comes to people knowing how to use it, how to build and operate pieces of it, uh, how to cope with some of the hazards that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so those, um, those deficiencies are also barriers to uptake and use uh, of the internet. So there's still plenty of work to be done to make this a useful uh, and safer environment for people to adopt. Now, I do have one story to tell though about mobiles. The original design of uh, the mobile handheld phone uh, was done uh, starting in 1973. A guy named Marty Cooper at Motorola has this idea. He sees car phones, but that takes up you know the, all the space in the trunk for the radio gear and everything else. He wants to have a handheld machine. So he starts designing this in 1973, same year that Bob Kahn and I start working on the internet. And uh, you know we just go along in parallel. We don't know anything about each other. And then a mutual friend of ours, Danny Cohen, in 1983, when the internet gets turned on for the first time uh, pr you know, on, on a production basis, and the handheld mobile uh, service from uh, Motorola uh, gets turned on at the same time. So Danny calls me up. And he says, come and have lunch. I have something to show you. I said, what is it? And he says, I'll come and have lunch. I'll show it to you. So I show up. And he has this thing sitting on the table. It's about you know, a foot tall. And it's got a whip antenna. And uh, I look at it. And he says, what's that? And he says, it's a phone. I said, well, where are the wires? And he says, there, there aren't any. He says, well, how does it work? So I asked him a bunch of questions. And eventually he says, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Why don't you call the guy that build it. So I call Marty Cooper on this handheld, we call it the uh, Motorola brick because it's, uh, it's a big honking heavy thing. So the first question I asked Marty was, hey Marty, how long does the battery last on this thing? And he says about 20 minutes, but you can't hold the phone up longer than that anyway, <laughs> so it's okay. So uh, what is interesting is that these two technologies went in parallel, in not interacting with each other at all, until 2007. That's only 15 years ago. And of course, the smartphone shows up in the form of the iPhone from Apple. And what I, I want to emphasize here is how much has changed in just 15 years. And so just imagine what could happen in the next 15 or the next 15 that we don't know about, that we might not even be prepared for. I just find that the most astonishing thing that in this short decade and a half we've become so dependent on those smartphones that when they don't work there are all kinds of cascade potential failures like I couldn't get logged in so I couldn't see the message that so I missed the business opportunity and my company collapses I mean, it just goes on and on. So I am worried that we are becoming over dependent on that one piece of technology and I would really like to see serious effort to make all the other screens and devices that are internet enabled be backup capability and substitutes in the case that we don't get a mobile signal or the battery is dead or something else has happened. You were about to react. Yeah, I want to I want to add a, uh, a counterpoint to it. You're asking about uh, uh, you know how do you reach the rest of the population? Vince has just taken us through a, a, a tour de force of the 15 years of technology that's changed. In that same 15 years, there's been another change as well, which is we all got 15 years older 
and 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 it's not just that, you wouldn't bring that up. And, and it's not just that we got older, but there's a new crop of people who didn't exist 15 years ago who are now ages zero through 15. Um, one of the spectacular changes is that you you approach in the societies that we live in a child, and I'm not talking about a school age child. I'm talking about a two year old and they go up to a television and they try to swipe it and they're very confused that nothing happens. <laughs> so the, the uh, literacy, in a sense, uh, has also changed. Uh, and so part of what's happening is that the population is changing along with the technology. So in addition to a lack of access, there's a number of challenges with the evolution of the internet and you already started mentioning a few misinformation, political polarization, uh, cyber security issues, cyber warfare, algorithmic bias, etc. Is there one particular issue that gives you pause or concern uh, in particular? So many to choose from. <laughs> um, I think I'm just going to pass on this because um, in addition to living and having had some small part of developing the technology, I'm a citizen and you know, a, 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 an inhabitant just like everybody here and subject to all the same forces. I'll, I'll, I'll let you try to say something more coherent than I would likely to say. Uh -oh. Look, uh, there are uh, a bunch of challenges, as, as you say. Uh, some of them have to do with safety and security. Some of them have to do with uh, the rapid propagation of misinformation and disinformation. I have a, a small theory about some of this. Um, warnings are probably an important survival factor, our response to warnings. You know, if you failed to notice it's a bear over there, you probably disappeared from the gene pool. The people that stayed were the ones that said, it's a bear, run. So warnings uh, often propagate more quickly, even if they're false, but it, because they fall into the warning category. So I think part of the experience we're seeing with rapid propagation of misinformation is a lot of it is a warning about the secret thing that somebody is trying to do that will be harmful to you. Uh, the only solution that I see to that is not technical. There's this wetware up here, and there's this process called critical thinking. And it's the thing that I believe we should be teaching our kids and adopting ourselves, which is ask questions like, where did this information come from? Uh, and so provenance may turn out to be a really important property that we would like information to have that we uh, can have access to. Uh, the second question, of course, is, uh, you know, is, is there any corroborating evidence for assertions that are being made? Uh, why is, is somebody handing me this information? Are they trying to convince me of something? So critical thinking, I think, is very important. The problem with it is it takes work. And some people may not be willing to do the work. Somebody else has already figured it out. I'll do whatever they tell me to do. Uh, that's not a good solution uh, if you want people to be thinking more critically. Uh, so between that and the other things that I mentioned before, which is agency and accountability, uh, which I believe we should start deliberately building into our legal uh, and, uh, and treaty structures as a respect for agency and a respect for an insistence on accountability. Uh, I spent uh, half a day at the State Department on cybercrime and, uh, uh, and cybersecurity, which are distinct topics. And a good deal of that conversation had to do with how we find ways to cooperate with each other in order to cope with the fact that a harmful act in one jurisdiction can harm a party in another one. And the, one of the most interesting principles that came out of that discussion was that if something is, is criminal in one country, it's going to be hard to get cooperation unless it's also criminal in the other one. And so this notion of dual criminality might turn out to be a core component. There's an awful, a lot of work to be done to make this a safer and more secure system. So uh, guess what? Uh, the job isn't over yet. <coughs> I mean, this, this plays into 
the, this next question too, so I'm glad you brought this up. Um, and I was thinking about it as, as Rima was, you know, asking her question about challenges and things. And, and you know, as us, you know, fellows at the Foundry, is oh, what brought you to the Foundry or what brought you to Company X? Oh, we have an interest in tech policy. And it's like when you guys were developing this thing, was the tech policy like even a thing? Like, like well, would that ever happen? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just interesting how it works out. But um, so in recent years, there's been talk about um, the internet undergoing a I've heard decoupling uh, with certain countries, like you were talking about before, operating in one sphere and others operating in a completely different one. Um, there seems to be kind of a lack of harmonization uh, in some ways. So can you comment on whether you agree with that sentiment? Um, and if you, if you do, uh, what issues do you think are, are coming up? And, and if there are um, not necessarily solutions, but you know, pathways to solutions? Um, first, the first thing I would observe is that uh, countries have the ability to turn the internet off, and some of them do uh, in the course of elections. Sometimes they just shut off the underlying communications capability. Without that, you can't carry the packets. So that happened during the uh, Arab Spring in Egypt, for example, and you see this in uh, other parts of the world as well. In fact, there are some organizations that track this sort of internet shutdowns. There's nothing that will stop a country from doing that. They have control over those assets within their uh, political boundaries. Um, there has been, however, a, an increasing uh, mantra called data sovereignty. And this is a mirror of, uh, of the Westphalian notion of sovereignty in a geopolitical uh, sense. Uh, I don't, I'm not a happy camper about that mantra because I don't believe that it's necessary to draw geopolitical boundaries around where information is in order to protect it and in order to uh, share it. I think the, what makes the internet useful is the connectivity that is created among all the machines that are part of the system, all the data centers, all the clouds. And so if you care about protecting the data, if that's, if that's the reason that you're asserting data sovereignty, you should encrypt the data and offer keys only to people who should have access to it, uh, as opposed to building hard barriers. And the Chinese, of course, have done a very good job of that, and the Russians are trying to emulate it with some lack of success, I would say. Uh, but that's not helpful, but they can do that. There's nothing we can do to stop that. So I don't worry so much about that. If you want to cut yourself off of the internet, fine, go ahead. However, the thing I do worry about is people or you know, uh, entities taking action that interferes with other people's ability to use the net. So as an example, uh, there's a routing system called the Border Gateway Protocol that the autonomous networks of the internet use to tell each other how they're interconnected. It's possible under the current design to issue false information about what the connectivity is. We have ways of fixing that. Uh, we have protocols for that. <coughs> but they haven't been um, broadly implemented. We need to do things, you know, provide incentives for operators to take up those mechanisms in order to make the system safer and more secure. We need for people to have access to two-factor authentication that's robust. And by that, I mean not just on your mobile phone, because mobile phones can be defeated in a two-factor authentication mode, maybe having little Titan chips or YubiKey chips or other things that establish cryptographic communications uh, is really helpful as a second factor. We need to make that easy for people to use. And one thing I've noticed about security is that there's always some, uh, you know, irreducible inconvenience associated with security and that is used as an excuse to not follow the rules. And so everything we can do as technologists to make it really easy and maybe almost impossible to avoid following the rules would be a good thing. At Google, one of the things that we think of is you've heard the term zero trust. We, we assume all networks are compromised, including our own. And so we build in mechanisms that are above the layer of the, of the network in order to establish bona fides. But there's still plenty of work to be done uh, in that space in order to uh, create an environment that's much safer than it is today. Steve? Thank you. I want to I want to pick up on uh, two points that you you touched on. One is uh, you talked about uh, a country could isolate itself, could take itself off the internet, 
uh, there's the complementary aspect which you which you mentioned, which is uh, pressure applied sometimes to take a different country off the net. Um, and uh, one of the more visible recent experiences one, yeah. was uh, Ukraine sent a formal note to ICANN, which we've both been involved in, asking to take Russia off the uh, internet in effect, to remove it from the domain name system. Um, I had to smile a little bit because uh, about a decade and a half earlier, I had been in Russia and had a very direct interaction with a uh, official there who expressed concern, what would happen if the U.S. took us off of the internet, uh, took us out of the domain name system was the particular thing. And I went to great pains to explain what all the controls were and that it was not only against policy, but there were a lot of checks and, ba uh, checks, uh, and uh, balance type um, um, in inhibitions against that that would, uh, would stop that. And um, I was also thinking in the back of my mind, I didn't want to say it, that it would be a very, very bad move uh, because it would instantaneously put the U.S. in a, a very negative position. It would be viewed uh, negatively by everybody in the world and that the reaction worldwide would be uh, a huge backlash. And worse yet, it would be relatively quick for uh, system administrators and programmers and hackers all over the world to develop workarounds. Uh, Boy Scouts would come out of the woodwork basically and develop all that. So what I wanted to say to this guy, and, and this guy was, was a very nice guy and he was, he was quite smart. Uh, he was the equivalent of deputy head of, of their uh, Federal Communications Commission counterpart. Not, that's not what they call it there. And he was leading a delegation down to uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, for uh, internet governance uh, uh, forum. And the, um, so what I wanted to tell him was if he could cause the U.S. to do something so stupid that the uh, result would be so beneficial to, the, to Russia that he would instantly be made a hero of the Russian Federation and he should do everything possible <laughs> to cause that to happen. But the um, uh, humor aside, uh, one of the lessons that has been learned pretty well, uh, not only for the internet, but think about the phone system. Uh, you can place a phone call to Cuba, you can place a phone call to Russia. There's been no disruption, uh, no matter what, throughout the Cold War, throughout all of these. <coughs> so the, the accumulated wisdom is that uh, there are things that you, can use when you're in a confrontational situation and other things that you best leave alone because the results would be far worse and uh, we all better off uh, leaving these in place. So that's, uh, you know, related to this issue of cutting people off. Yeah. And then you mentioned uh, Westphalian uh, uh, issues. So that's uh, 1642, I guess, the uh, 48. 48, excuse me. Um, decision that uh, countries countries had a certain degree of sovereignty and they shouldn't interfere with each other. The, the internet is not the only thing that brings that model uh, uh, into a challenged position that, that, that provides stress. You have other commonalities. You know, we all share the same air, we share the same oceans and so forth. <coughs> so the, the, the models that have served very well from a certain point of view, historically over the last several hundred years, are um, uh, showing some signs of stress. And it's not clear how to evolve, um, but it is clear that there's going to have to be some degree of evolution. And the choices are either going to be incremental and relatively smooth or not incremental and not so smooth. Um, we'll just have to see how it plays out. And the internet is a piece of, but not the sole participant in that uh, evolution that is making the world smaller and flatter, if you will. And then, of course, we have a few issues with, with respect to, the, to our planet versus our people. Different topic. Mm -hmm. so, so I have one more, and then, uh, and then I think we've got some from the other fellows. Um, so 
playing off that, another thing that I've heard discussed is the idea that we have moved from a values-driven internet to an interest-driven one. Uh, as two gentlemen who were there at the beginning, do you agree with that sentiment? Uh, and do you think those things are mutually exclusive? Yes, of course. Um, so the, another thing that uh, I've heard discussed is the idea that we've moved from a values-driven internet to an interest-driven one. Do you agree with that sentiment? Uh, and, and or do you think these things are mutually exclusive? Well, I don't, you know, to be really honest with you, I think interests have always driven uh, an awful lot of everything people do. Uh, of course, there are a wide range of different kinds of interests. Some of those are driven by values. So I think it's all, it may be a false dichotomy to ask the question quite that way. Uh, if you uh, want an interpretation of the values side of things, I think that there was a certain idealism associated with the early days of the Internet. Uh, getting computers to interconnect with each other, making things happen 3,000 miles away was you know, nothing short of miraculous and fun. Uh, and, uh, and we were all, you know, looking at this as, a, this is amazing, can we actually get this to work? You know, and, and now that it's working, what can we do with it? Um, I think what happens is that uh, as it becomes commercialized, which begins in uh, the 1980s, we see Cisco systems in 1984, Juniper comes later, uh, Proteon, uh, start to monetize the equipment and software associated with internet and then the World Wide Web shows up, first uh, in its very open uh, variety in 1991, 93, the uh, Mosaic browser comes out of NCSA it gets Jim Clark's attention, who uh, did Silicon Graphics, and he sees the World Wide Web, and he says there's a business there, grabs the guys from NCSA and drags them out to the West Coast and starts Netscape Communications in 1994, in which year I had gone back to MCI to start building internets for them, and they wanted to build an MCI mall. So I bought $7 million worth of licenses from Netscape Communications to build this mall. I should have bought seven million dollars worth of stock, but it didn't. I, that was the company's money; it wasn't mine. So um, the thing is that that this stuff starts to get seriously commercialized. Uh, internet service shows up in commercial form in 1989, and so you know we're talking 30 plus years ago. So a lot of today's investment is driven by commercial interest, and, and to, the, to the extent that that was the distinction you were trying to make, I agree with that. I think that the heavy uh, evolution of the system now is being driven by uh, business opportunity more than anything else. You still see a lot of open source software, though, which is that there is the spirit of sharing is not dead. Yeah, that's, that I think is, is a crucial point that uh, it, it's easy to take phrases like interests versus values, set up a dichotomy, and then you know try to have that argument. These things basically coexist in in ever changing mixtures, and uh, if one insists on seeing it only one way, then you're you're, you're off by quite a bit in terms of uh, having a useful model. So it's more a question of degree, uh, and the degrees are shifting. Uh, uh, commercial interests obviously play a huge uh, role, but uh, uh, so does idealism and uh, just the sheer fun of being able to explore and create. Um, and, and so you know, I think one has to look at these things in a more delicate and nuanced way than just a simple dichotomy of, and, and particularly trying to choose one side or the other. So to finish with our moderated questions and then we'll get into one or two audience questions before our time is up. What opportunities on the horizon uh, keep you excited about the, the future of the internet and what sort of advice in that vein do you have for future generations interacting with, with this technology? Uh, one of the things that uh, is very different 
I'll just speak very personally from my point of view. Uh, you know, back from 1960s and 70s versus here, so, you know, 50 year span more or less, is that uh, the world that we could, that I could touch was principally within the U.S. and a little bit of foreign travel. Nowadays, uh, you live in a, a completely connected to the rest of the world um, without any trouble at all, for ex you know, subject to the digital divide issue, but uh, just in terms of geography, and with the geography comes cultures and language and uh, a tremendous amount of um, uh, access to history and to other effects. Uh, and so I watch my children and I watch their children, and the, um, you know, the, the diversity in every dimension, not only just diversity of uh, races and um, religions and so forth, but every sort of thing that they're exposed to and that they take as a given and that they enjoy and that they you know, t uh, make use of is really quite phenomenal. And uh, that's quite enlivening. That's, that's a, a very big positive thing. So I started taking some notes. Um, the first observation I'd make is that it, it essentially everything that you see in the internet is the result of software. I mean, that's what animates the whole thing. So if you're looking at opportunities, uh, software is still a huge opportunity uh, if you can figure out how to program something. Uh, and we're certainly starting to see tools uh, that allow people to effectively program without programming. I mean, these sort of you know, audio uh, speech interactions uh, that cause things to happen. There's lots of software being executed behind Google's answers to your voiced questions. Uh, and there are even some um, exploration of the ability to describe what it is you want to have happen and have the system try to prepare some software uh, to, uh, to achieve that objective. Open source is another uh, area where the, the sharing allows people to learn how things work. You know, in the early days of routers, you know, the router was, was uh, built by getting a computer and a graduate student, and you wrap the graduate student around the computer and that turns it into a router. But eventually we ran out of graduate students to do that with, so Cisco and Proteon and others started selling uh, those things. But the early days, you got to know what was going on inside because it was still a research project, the software was available. Then it became commercial and all the software was hidden. Now more of it is available, so people have the chance to learn more about um, how to program all kinds of things that are, uh, have computers in them. So I think that's an important uh, element. Uh, one thing I will observe, uh, our experience with the pandemic has taught us a number of interesting lessons. One of them is that uh, not everybody can work at home for a variety of different reasons. Probably the job that requires proximity uh, or you don't have a place that's uh, you know quiet or you fought with the kids over the Wi-Fi because there wasn't enough capacity. Uh, but we have learned that flexibility is, is possible. Companies have discovered that people actually can work and will work at home. So that's an important lesson. The other thing, a very important lesson, is that the supply chains are fragile. And we discovered very quickly how broken they could be. Uh, we also discovered that um, the Internet, as good as it is about erasing distance, doesn't do anything about time zones. And so when you're trying to do things online with a whole bunch of people, and some of them are up at 6 a.m., and others at 3 a.m., and somebody else at 10 p.m. Um, and we haven't figured out how to deal with that problem yet. Uh, we're working on it. So uh, my general sense is that there is infinite opportunity lying ahead. Just to add one more thing on the AI and machine learning, which gets overhyped, uh, it's also fair to observe that machine learning and neural networks have done some pretty damned amazing things. DeepMind just announced that it had modeled 200 million, the folding of 200 million different proteins, which are essentially all the ones that we even know about. So uh, that, I guess, is going to turn into opportunity to understand, uh, you know, medical opportunities or understand all kinds of other complex uh, biochemical uh, opportunities, uh, interactions, and the like. So there are lots of things where machine learning has actually done something good. Speech understanding, speech recognition, speech generation, 
uh, interactive systems uh, are all feasible because of those technologies. But at the same time, we need to re remember that they are potentially very brittle, uh, depending on what their training is and on what problem or um, situation the machine learning network has been exposed to. It could make very bad decisions. And we aren't too good yet at noting ahead of time what kinds of mistakes those systems are going to make. So I keep wondering about self-driving cars. We in have a big investment in that in the Waymo part of the Alphabet company. And they keep trying to figure out, how, does the how do I know that the car knows that I'm there? I mean, I can catch somebody's eye if there's a person behind the wheel. And that sort of gives me some sense that they at least they know I'm there. But I don't know how to do that with a car that doesn't have a driver. And so that's an example of one of the conundrums that uh, this sort of thing presents. All right, so we have just a couple of minutes left. And so I think we can get into maybe one or two of the questions that was submitted. So one question we have is that many of the Foundry Fellows are looking at the emergence of decentralized protocols. Uh, blockchain, smart contracts, et cetera, uh, the building blocks of the decentralized web as an exciting place for innovation. As one of the, cre as some of the creators of the original version of the internet, do you see any promising developments in the decentralized web? Well, look, first of all, the Internet was designed to be decentralized, and it still is. I mean, it's just the fact that you see concentrations of implementation of the networks doesn't mean that, it's decent that it is centralized. Uh, it just means that some of it's concentrated. So that's the first point. The second point is that um, we've actually discovered that some centralization is very useful. An example of this is, uh, is the open flow networking, software-defined networking system which has a central component to it. Uh, it does computations very efficiently and it uses the resources better than some of the decentralized algorithms do. So uh, centralization is not necessarily uh, evil or anything like that. Uh, when people talk about decentralization and they point to blockchain and they talk about you know the uh, anonymous blockchains and how wonderful all that is, my first reaction is, well, uh, first of all, Anonymous blockchain means that I don't know who I'm depending on uh, for the operation of the system, then that frankly makes me nervous. So if I'm going to do blockchain at all, I'd like to know who's involved. So that's called permission blockchains. Um, second, not all blockchains have to have uh, crazy um, uh, computational requirements like Bitcoin does. There are others that don't have that, so that's helpful. I'm uh, not sure that this... Um, mantra of pushing for decentralization is necessarily going to solve all problems. Think for a minute. Suppose you say, well, uh, here's what we're going to do. Everybody's got all these laptops and they all have huge amounts of storage, so why don't we agree to, to store each other's information? We'll just you know, fully distribute everything. Let's even pretend that it's technically possible to do that. The data is encrypted, so you know, you don't, the, your, your privacy isn't uh, at risk. Then the question will be, uh, Joe, uh, who's got some of your information on his laptop, decides to replace the laptop. And the question is, how important is it to Joe to make sure that all your data got replicated on the next laptop? And the answer might be not very, which is why sometimes you want to turn to organizations who see it as their job to make sure that all of your data is, uh, is replicated and uh, retained and not lost and backed up and everything else. So I'm not uh, persuaded these days that centraliz uh, decentralization is necessarily uh, something to be sought uh, for its, its own value. I think it's useful for resilience, uh, but maybe not so much for some other reasons. Yeah, you know, so the first the first thought about blockchain is a very clever technology, but it's been hyped uh, way beyond um, appropriate level, in my view, um, uh, almost to the point of a, of a joke. Blockchain's the answer, what's your problem? Yes. Uh, kind of thing. Um, 
you know, most of what I've said uh, today has fallen into the broad category of avoiding the extremes and looking at things from a balanced point of view. And equally, you know, looking to the future, um, the problems and the opportunities uh, are all going to fall into the, in, into the middle ground of how do you look more deeply into the way things are working, where are the opportunities to improve things. And it is not going to be a simple thing of replace everything with this or, you know, this answer will, you know, this piece of technology will solve all your problems. You have to really look and see um, which things matter in terms of the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so that was a kind of a general uh, mild rant, if you will. Uh, and then you can pick whatever problem you like and I can, I can expand down that path almost, uh, you know, without exception, you know, pick, pick your problem, I don't even have to name them. And it, they will all have this quality that the extremes are probably not the right answer and that the hard problems, the challenges, and the opportunities are, are trying to dissect where the, what the interplay of the various forces are. And then you, and that is worthwhile uh, work for us and for the next generation and generations after that. A uh, couple, they never resist an open microphone. A uh, couple of things. First of all, you mentioned smart contracts. And uh, setting aside buzzwords for just a second, it's a very interesting <laughs> idea because imagine that you've got a contract with someone uh, for some service and uh, it's possible for the software that, that represents the agreement, the commitments that are in that smart contract, to, it's possible for that software to monitor the state of the service that's being delivered. And so if it can tell how things are going, whether it was a contract to develop a piece of software or uh, to provide a regular service of some kind, if it can tell how things are going, then it can automate, uh, you could automate the process of alarming in the event that some term or condition of the contract has not been satisfied. And so the idea of having some kind of a piece of software in the background that's monitoring things for you at the right level of uh, granularity is actually kind of a really interesting thought. And so I don't want to lose some of these ideas in the course of, uh, of o the overhype that shows up. I, when, when blockchain first showed up, my first reaction was, blockchain is the new Brill Cream. And uh, not everyone will recognize that reference because it's a 20th century reference to some stuff that you were supposed to put in your hair that uh, you know, improved your romance life. Of course, uh, I don't have any hair left, so Brill Cream isn't helping me any. Uh, but you know, blockchain is not that. It's also not a stupid technology, though. There are, there are, we use it at Google for a number of applications, but it has to be sized to the application uh, to be appropriate at scale, at the right scale. So uh, I get excited about what you can do with software, but here's the problem. Uh, in the 80 plus years that humans have been programming computers, we've never figured out how to avoid making mistakes. And those mistakes we often call bugs. And if you talk to programmers, you often will find that they all have a little dent here in their foreheads from the millions of times they've gone, God, how can I make such a stupid mistake? So one of the things that I would love to see the next generation challenge to do is to build better programming environments that will tell us when we're about to do something dumb, like reference a variable that never got set to make a decision, or uh, you know, going through a loop too many times or not enough times. Uh, those are, st or reading in a piece of data into a buffer that's too small, so it goes buffer overflows and you execute software that you shouldn't be executing. We really need better programming tools. And so that's a challenge to the research community. All right, so with that, I think we'll close out our Q&A session. A huge thank you to Drs. Vince Cerf and Steve Crocker Love a round of applause. <laughs> and to anyone on our live stream or listening to this podcast later, 
Uh, thanks for tuning in to the tech policy grind. With that, I'll hand it over to, to Joe to close well, us out. Just thank you very much, Rima. A sincere thanks to both uh, uh, you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Surf, Dr. Crockett, for being with us. Uh, this has really been a pleasure. Just a, a few more thank yous. Thank you to Rima uh, for, for putting, uh, making all this happen. Thank you to Tim Lorden and the Internet Education Foundation because uh, this, this whole thing wouldn't have happened without them either. Um, as well as all my colleagues uh, at the fourth class uh, Foundry Fellows for their support. Uh, this podcast recording will be available both on the Foundry website or wherever get you, your, you get your podcasts in the coming days. Uh, if you are in person, please join us for uh, refreshments in the back. And if you're online, I just want to thank you again for joining, and, uh, and we uh, hope to see you again soon.